Hello there, my fellow seekers of the primordial truth, and welcome to my third episode covering the one and only Primarch Lorgar, the Bible Thumper. Previously, we introduced this zealous guy by talking about his formative years on Colchis, his rejoining and reshaping of the Legion, his excessive worship of the Emperor despite being told not to, and finally the brutal chastisement on Monarchia. Today, we will pick up right where we left off last time and talk about what happened to the word bearers after Monarchia, and the beginnings of Lorgar's pilgrimage in search of some better gods. I am your host, the Grim Dark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? After the raising of Monarchia, the history of the 17th Legion divides. One is a history of the Legion that the Imperium believed existed for decades after. The history of a Legion pulling itself from the pit of the past and embracing its true calling. But this one is a false history. The second is a shadow history. The true history that hid behind the mask of seeming loyalty. This true history can never be known fully, and what Imperial scholars do know of it are only distorted glimpses. On the surface, Lorgar's response to the Emperor's censure was to withdraw within himself. For a time, the Legion seems to have disappeared out of the Great Crusade. When they returned, it was clear that they were a changed force. Whereas before they lingered after conquests, they now drove forward with relentless abandon. Worlds burned, civilizations were made to kneel, and a trail of swift conquest and imperial compliance actions stretched behind them like a bloody cloak. It is said that the emperor was pleased that his son had understood his error and would, in time, become what he was destined to be. To every other eye, the word-bearers seem possessed by a penitent fury and grim resolve to burn the past. All of them, however, were deceived, for in secret, another ring was made. That Lorgar was shaken by the shattering of his universe seemed very likely. But what action did that prompt? At the time, some thought that the 17th Legion had withdrawn in shame and that its return to the Great Crusade was fueled by a wish to atone. Such a kind reading of events no longer rings true. Instead, it seems likely that Lorgar's fall began after Monarchia, that the dark powers of the warp reached out to him in his moment of doubt and offered him what the Emperor denied him, a higher power to believe in. It is not entirely known who the voices that counseled him belong to, or the hands which guided him to damnation. Again, much remains hidden, but a number of candidates seems likely. Corfaeron, Lorgar's surrogate father on Colchis and close advisor, seems a very likely source of poison, as does the Legion's first chaplain Erebus. Both of those assholes were steeped in the old faith of Colchis, a faith that was tainted by the powers of the warp long before Lorgar even fell from the sky. For over four standard decades, the 17th Legion wore a false face of loyalty, and planted the seeds that would eventually bloom into a galaxy-spanning civil war. The precise nature of their preparations is only open to supposition, but much can be deduced from Lorgar's character and the atrocities that would come later. First, it seems likely that the word-bearer's renewed energy in the Great Crusade was only a cover for its rapid growth in size, as well as the seeding of its new corrupting creed and belief in chaos onto other worlds and legions. It must have also been during this time that a legion was cleansed of descent. The last of the old iconoclasts, the few Terrans remaining, and those who would not embrace the new faith must have been quietly put to the sword. The corruption of much of the apparatus of the Imperium must have also occurred during this time. So it was that when Horus finally fell to the temptations of the ruinous powers, big, hashtag blame it on Erebus, Lorgar had already long prepared his ground for war. The idea of the pilgrimage 
a journey to the legendary place where mortals could directly interact with the gods was an ancient mythological trope on many human settled worlds of the Milky Way galaxy, including Lorgar's beloved cultures. Of course, such a place did exist, and one could discover the primordial truth of the universe there. For example, that the Immaterium was dominated by the powerful spiritual entities known as the Chaos Gods. Prompted by First Captain Kor Phaeron and First Chaplain Erebus, Lorgar journeyed with his Wordbearer's Legion's Chapter of the Serrated Sun to what was then the fringes of Imperial space, as part of the 1301st Expeditionary Fleet at the Great Crusade. At this time, Lorgar had not yet fallen to the corruption of chaos, though he had turned against the Emperor as a deity no longer worthy of worship. Because if you're not gonna let me worship you, I'm gonna take my toys and go home. Lorgar believed that the Emperor was wrong in condemning mankind's natural instinct to seeking out the divine. Though Lorgar no longer had any love or loyalty for the Emperor, he and the 17th Legion rejoined the Great Crusade, but they did so only so their efforts could serve as a front for more shady activities. The Word Bearers were also accompanied on this pilgrimage by five members of the Legio Custodes, who had been sent by the Emperor to watch over everything the Word Bearers did to prevent them from slipping into error once again. The word bearer's pursuit of any scrap of information that could be found on the primordial truth, or the nature of the place where gods and mortal met, led the 1301st Expeditionary Fleet to the Cadia system, near the largest permanent warp storm in the galaxy, later known in the Imperium as the Eye of Terror. The fleet's master of astropaths informed Lorgar that unusual voices in the warp were heard in the vicinity of the Great Warp Rift, voices that spoke directly to the Primarch as well, which were the voices of the Chaos Entities within the Materium. It would be in the Cadia system that Lorgar would learn his suspicions had been correct, and that the shape of all the religions across the galaxy that possessed so many similarities to the Colchesian Old Faith were not artifacts of mankind's collective unconsciousness, but expressions of worship in the universal truth that was chaos. The decision was made to hold orbit over Cadia and for the fleet's elements to make planetfall on the unknown world, designated then as 1301-12. The landing force was comprised of the Imperial Army, Word Bearers, Legio Custodes, and Legio Cybernetica elements. The landing party, led by Lorgar himself, was greeted by a large number of barbaric human tribes, tribes described as dressed in rags and wielding spears tipped by flint blades, yet showing little fear. Most notable were the barbarian's purple eyes, which reflected the color of the Eye of Terror itself, in the spectrum of visible light. Despite the custodian Vendatha's protest and request to execute the heathens, the word bearers approached the natives peacefully. A strange woman came out of the crowd and addressed the Primarch directly, calling him Lorgar Aurelian and welcoming him to Cadia. The woman, the Chaos Priestess Ingathel, would ultimately lead the Primarch down a path of spiritual enlightenment that actually marked the beginning of Lorgar's fall to chaos and heresy. Within the Eye of Terror, the serrated sun chapter of the Wordbearer's Legion witnessed the failure of the ancient Eldar Empire. This was seen firsthand in the form of the Crone Worlds, that had been scoured of all life that littered the ice region of space. Ingefell, of course, lied to the word bearers about how the Chaos God Slanesh had truly been born, and warned that the Eldar had failed as a species and suffered the fall because at the moment of their ascension they were unable to accept the primordial truth. They gave birth to a god of pleasure, yet they had felt no joy at her coming. The nature of the primordial truth was revealed to the word bearers in the ashes of the Eldar Empire, 
and Ingefell warned them that in order for humanity as a species to survive, they must not commit the same sins as the Eldar did, and must obviously accept the worship of chaos. The surviving space marines of the Wordbearer's serrated sun chapter eventually returned to Cadia and related to Lorgar all that had happened, and all that they learned while within the eye, the place where mortals and gods could actually meet. These Astartes had been forever changed by their experience, for they had all become fusions of mortal and demon within the eye, and came to form a new unit of word bearers known as the Galvor Bak. After the visits into the Eye of Terror, Lorgar ordered a cyclonic bombardment of Cadia, wiping out the Cadians and leaving the planet abandoned so that no one else could stumble upon the secret of the primordial truth that had been entrusted to him alone by the Chaos Gods. However, the planet's extremely strategic location meant that it would prove useful to the Imperium, and in the 32nd millennium, Imperial colonists were dispatched to resettle the world. But Lorgar's enlightenment, however, was not yet done. Having heard the report of what the Astartes of the Serrated Sun chapter had experienced within the Eye, Lorgar was determined to meet with the gods himself. 43 years before the Dropsite Massacre on Istvan V, Lorgar took flight on a Stormbird gunship into the Eye of Terror, and stepped onto the surface of the Crone World of Shanriatha. He was accompanied in his search by his guide Ingefell the Ascended who was none other than the priestess from Cadia, who had in the meanwhile upgraded herself to demonhood. The creature inquired why the Primarch had chosen this world to investigate. Lorgar said that he had seen the ruins from orbit, a city drowned in the rust-red dust plains that reminded him of the surface of Mars. The Primarch wanted to know what kind of creature Ingafell was to which the demon prince replied that Lorgar knew what she was. But to Lorgar's psychically attuned eyes, he could see nothing in the core of the creature's being, a creature incarnated without a soul. Ingefell explained that in the realm of the flesh, sentient life was born and sold. In the realm of raw thought, the immaterium, all life was soulless. Both were alive the born and the never born, on both sides of reality, and were destined for symbiosis and union if the chaos gods had their way. The world that they now stood upon was where the realm of flesh and spirit met. Physical laws meant nothing here. There was no limit on what might be. That was the nature of chaos. Endless possibility. Ingefell informed Lorgar that he was unique among the Emperor's sons for all his brothers were whole, and only he was lost, for his brothers had mastered their gifts since birth. Lorgar's own mastery would come only with understanding, but when it did, he would have the strength to reshape entire worlds on a whim. Lorgar then inquired as to what was the name of the world they now stood upon. Ingefell informed him that the Soul Broken, or the Eldar, called it Ikresa before the fall. After the birth of Slanesh, it was named Shanriatha, which in the Eldar language meant never forgotten. Ingefell explained to Lorgar the reason the Eldar were called the Soul Broken among the servants of Chaos, and it had to do with the birth of the Lord of Pleasure. In her genesis, brought about by the Eldar's worship, she claimed the spirits of the entire race, when any mortal dies, its spirit drifts into the warp, but when the Eldar die, they are pulled right into the maw of the goddess they betrayed. Lorgar commented that what Ingefell mentioned matched the teachings of the Old Faith on Colchis, for it was said that upon death, the unshackled souls drifted into the infinite, to be judged by thirsting gods. Ingefell replied that the primordial truth was deeply embedded in humanity's blood, all of mankind knew innately that something awaited them after death. The faithful, the loyal, would be judged kindly and reside in their God's domain within the realm of chaos. The faithless, on the other hand, the unbelievers, would drift throughout the ether, 
serving as prey for the Neverborn. Though the Materium represented the heaven promised in most human faiths across history, it was also the same hell humanity had always feared. How's that for a twist? As the demon guide and the Primarch moved on with their exploration, they came upon some vast ruins. These ruins were not the remains of a city, but the remnants of the craft world Zulasa, which had attempted to flee the birth of Slanesh, but escaped too late and fell from the sky to bury itself in the world's lifeless dust. 200,000 souls within the craft world had died at the moment of Slanesh's birth. Unguided, with madness rampant in its own living core, as the Prince of Pleasure devoured its souls, the craft world had fallen. Investigating further, Lorgar sent something within the ruin. As he inspected the ruins of the massive spacecraft with his psychic probing, he felt something stir beneath, burrowing upward. Something broke the surface, in what first appeared to the shocked Primarch as the statue of a dying god that dragged itself from a grave of scarlet soil. Ingefell informed Lorgar that it was an avatar of Kayla Mensha Cain, the former war god of the Eldar. Ingefell wanted Lorgar to understand the object lesson, that even a divine being could fall. Almost pitying the pathetic creature, Lorgar strode forth and raised his crozier's mace and then struck the creature, ending its pathetic existence. Then Lorgar wanted to know what the future held. The demon informed the Primarch that it would end as it had begun. It would end in war. Lorgar ordered the demon to show him this. But what the creature showed him, and the subsequent trials, however, are a story for another time. And that, my friends, is what I wanted to tell you about Lorgar's story for today. I'm sorry if you felt I ended it with a bit too much of a cliffhanger, but I do believe telling the entire story of Lorgar's pilgrimage and chaos trials in a single video would have made the episode a bit too long for the format I do things in. But rest assured, I will cover all of those and more in the next episode of Lorgar the series. So stay tuned for that. What are your thoughts on Lorgar's actions post-Monarchia? Was he right to sulk and change so radically? What would have made a bigger, positive difference in your opinion? Let us know and discuss in the comments below. Was this video informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for future content. Thank you very much for watching, and I wish you all a great day. The Emperor protects.